In this video, I'm going to try to wrap my head around FIMIX, Finite Mixture Analysis, in Smart PLS4. I will not claim to be an expert on this, although I think I figured a few things out. So hopefully this will be helpful. The problem FIMIX is trying to solve is that there might be latent or hidden groups or subsamples within our sample that we're not a priori theorizing about or planning for that may create hidden heterogeneity in our measurement model which then may affect the parameters and estimates of our structural model and thereby invalidate our findings. But it's all hidden, so we don't know. So what FIMIX tries to do is find those hidden segments, is what they call them, so that you can account for them or so that you can at least say that there are no hidden segments. So this is a lot like latent class analysis or cluster analysis where you're trying to find hidden profiles. So the way we'll go about this is we will go to Calculate, FIMIX, and there are a few settings here. Let me zoom in. So the first is number of segments. You don't want to have too many segments because in the end, if you do find segments, you'll need to do essentially a multi-group analysis where each segment has to have enough sample size to reach statistical power. So in this model, let me zoom back out, we could very roughly calculate sample size requirements by looking at the variable with the most arrows going into it satisfaction with customers. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven arrows going into it. Again, very roughly, we could multiply by 10. That gets us 70. I know we have about 300 in our sample size. If we were to divide 300 by 70, then the maximum number of groups we could have is around four. 70 times four is 280, still less than 300. So we don't want more than four segments. Let's go back, Fimix, the iterations, Let's just leave it 5,000, stop criterion, don't worry about it. And number of repetitions, 10 is a good number. It does take some time to calculate though. So we're gonna do this iteratively. I'm actually gonna start with one, which means we don't have any segments. It's just all of the data. Start calculation, super fast, go to the report. And what we wanna look at is the fit indices. Just gonna copy these out to Excel. Paste them here. This was for one segment, go back. And we're just going to run this again, but for two segments, and then three, and then four. I'm going to speed this up for you, because I'm not going to do anything new during these runs. All right, we now have all four sets of fit indices, but there's actually literature showing that these are not all equally useful. The best ones to use, according to the literature, are AIC3, CAIC, and EN for entropy. So I'm actually just going to select the rest and get rid of those. And what we want to do is find segments with 0.5 or above entropy. Looks like they all have that, so that's good. And then we want to find the minimum for AIC3. You can eyeball this, or if you have a lot of segments, you can actually just highlight them go to conditional formatting, top bottom rules, bottom 10 items, but then just reduce that to one item, copy that format and paste it over that. All right, what we'd like to see ideally is some consistency. We'd like to see that both AIC3 and CAIC are minimized on a single segment selection. That's not the case here. We have with our AIC3, the smallest one being four segments, and for CIC, one segment, meaning no segments really. So that's tricky. The next thing we should do before we make any decisions here is we should look at the segment sizes. So back over in Smart PLS 4, go over here to segment sizes, and we want all of the segments to have at least 5% of the data. It looks like we do. Segment 4 is pretty small. It has 8.1% of the data, but that is enough. So that doesn't exclude a four segment approach. So then the next thing I would do is maybe create a new statistic down here, a new calculation called summed fit, and just make that equal to the sum of the two fit measures and drag that across. And again, we want the lowest. I'm just gonna copy the format there and paint it here. And it looks like the winner is one segment. Well, that's great for me in reality. That means I don't have hidden heterogeneity issues, most likely, but it's terrible for this video. <laughs> 
So in reality, at this point, I would say I'm done. There are no hidden groups and I can just analyze my data all together. But for the sake of this video and showing you what you would do if you did have segments, let's just pretend for a moment that we had two segments, that the two lowest indices were for the two segment approach. Well, what I would do next is go back to Smart PLS 4, go back, select reports, and do the two segment report, which should still be there. If not, just run two segments again. Go to segment sizes. Yes, this is the two segment report. And it looks like 71% of the data is in segment one and 28% is in segment two. Now what I want to do is go to segment assignment. And you have two reports here. One is the probability of being in a specific segment. This is a lot like cluster analysis. And the other is if it had to force you into one group or another, which group would you be in? Using this, I'm going to create a new data file. I will rename it Vimix. And in this, I don't need the probabilistic assignments. I do need the segment assignments and the manifest variable scores. Hit create. We now have a new data set. So I can go back and save this and go back again. And you can see there is a new data set right here called Fimix Sohana Observed. I'm going to double click on this and click on Indicator Correlations because I'm curious what might be driving this heterogeneity issue. I'm going to copy this out to Excel, stick it in here. And what I'm curious about is what has the strongest correlation with discrete segment assignment. Once again, if there are a lot, we can just select that whole row Go to conditional formatting, highlight cell rules, greater than, and I want to do anything greater than 0.2. Hit OK. And let's see if it highlighted any. Hmm, it appears we don't have any strong correlations with the segmenting variable. What does that tell me? That tells me that this table up above is accurate, that we really don't have multiple segments in our data. But again, for the sake of this video, Let's pretend we do. So how are we gonna do that? Well, let's format this instead, instead of above 0.2, which is just a threshold I made up, just means there's a meaningful correlation. Instead, I'll do top bottom and select the top three items, hit okay. And looks like it is autonomy, measure two, and feedback, measure two, and learning orientation, number one. Well, that's a lot of things. So it's gonna be hard to name it. What if, though, for example, we found that it was all about autonomy. Let's just pretend again for the sake of this video. What if it was all about autonomy? And we saw positive numbers here. Well, that means that for the binary discrete segment assignment, where we have two segments, one and two, an increase in autonomy leads to a positive change in that discrete segment variable, meaning you're more likely to be in segment two than in segment one if you have more autonomy. That being the case, what I could do is go back to my data, click on Generate Groups, and we're going to generate based on this discrete segment assignment, and hit Apply. And we'll just rename them. And we know that Group 1 represents the low autonomy group, so I'll type low autonomy, hit Apply. And we know Group 2 represents the high autonomy group. Again, we're just pretending because we didn't actually find this in our data, but this is good for the video to show you what you might end up doing. Well, now we have groups. We're going to go back. We're going to go into our Femix model and select the new data set. Select Femix Observed. Go to Calculate. We're going to do an importance performance map analysis. This will tell us for each group, each segment, which variables are good predictors. Target construct will be our dependent variable, satisfaction with customers. And then very importantly, go to data. Don't do it for the whole data set, do it for the grouped data set and start calculation. That should be pretty quick. And if we want to visualize these differences, we can highlight paths, use absolute values. And right now we're seeing it for the high autonomy group. If we were to toggle back to the low autonomy group, we'd see what changes. Toggle, toggle. So it looks like from feedback, we see some pretty big changes. So again, this is the low autonomy group. If we switch over to the high autonomy group, wow, those are some huge changes. Now we can also see this if we go to report and down here in the quality criteria, click on the first one 
and you get this importance performance map, which we can export. I'll just stick this in a PowerPoint. And then I will do this again, but for the low autonomy group. Export, export, and I'm going to paste this over it, and I'm going to remove the gray color. The way to do that is double click on that picture and on color, select transparent color and just click on the gray. And now what we have is both visible here. Notice we have a line for zero. If you don't have a line, that means zero didn't show up in your importance axis. And that's fine too. But with the zero, I can line these up, which is kind of convenient. And we can see how things pan out. So remember the one on the bottom is for high autonomy. The one on the top is for low autonomy. And so for low autonomy, it looks like the importance scores are higher, particularly for this green square, which is participation. Participation is a very important predictor of satisfaction with customers for those with low autonomy. Other big differences are with the yellow diamond and the red circle. Feedback. And I think that's learning orientation. Let me move this just to be sure. Yes, learning orientation. For the low autonomy group, we can see that learning orientation is very important, whereas for the high autonomy group, it is not very important, and just the opposite for feedback. For feedback, notice when I move this, the yellow dot is way over on the left. For a low autonomy group, and for a high autonomy group, it's way over on the right. So there are some pretty significant differences between the importance of certain predictors based on which segment you're in. And that's what I would report, along with this table up here to provide evidence that we do actually have segments. Now, again, in this one, we didn't, we just made this up. But if, for example, the lowest values were on multiple segments, then this table would provide support for our actions. And that's that. Sorry I didn't have a better model to actually exhibit segmentation. Good luck.